the book on the right for the last week, so I'll hold it on the left today. And before I introduce today's guest, hey everybody, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people who are doing great things in the world. I just wanted to mention that my third book with Glenn Merzer, which is called Own Your Health, was released a week ago. And if you buy it before Sunday, the 18th of October at midnight and email your receipt to Chef AJ Bonus at yahoo.com. We'll send you amazing bonuses, bonus recipes, bonus videos, and the audio file of the book so you won't have to buy it on Audible. And speaking of the book, the guests today have something to do with it. One is my co-author, or it's actually, I was his co-author, but we work together on many endeavors, Glenn Merzer, but we also have somebody very special. This is, I think, only the third time I've had a movie star on the show, and uh, both big screen and small screen. And but what impresses me even more about his wonderful work in in cinema and television, you probably know him from St. Elsewhere and multiple times nominated for an Emmy. I personally love all his work with Christopher Guest so much, but he's vegan and he's an environmentalist. And I think that he might be remembered for that work just as much, if not more. And I'd love to find out more about it. But he actually endorsed our book. And he says, Own Your Health is the funniest book on diet you'll ever read. And it's the diet that's right for the planet. Please welcome Glenn Merzer and Ed Begley Jr. Thank you guys so much for being here. Thanks for having me on, AJ. It is wonderful. It's wonderful to see you. I know I don't know you very well, but I, we've traveled in the same circles and I've seen you at VegFest. And I just love you. You are one of the few people that became vegan before me. I think it was 1970, right? I did. I started in 1970. That's when I got fed up with the smog in LA and I started to do things like drive a small electric car, became a vegetarian, and I uh, started using all biodegradable soaps and detergents. I started recycling. And everything that I did was very cost effective, but it was different being a vegetarian back then. The only veggie meats that they had were like these uh, like Loma Linda or something brand meats, and they weren't very tasty. But you guys, people like you, you specifically, AJ, to have these wonderful dishes, make it not just palatable, but delicious beyond words. That really makes all the difference in the world. So I got to thank you from the bottom of my heart for making these wonderful meals, having these great recipes in this book. And my dear friend, my hero, Glenn Merzer, for writing this book, writing Mad Cowboy and getting the word out about how wrong it is in every way for your own health and for everybody's health to eat meat. Him and Howard uh, Lyman, what they did was just spectacular with this book. He, with this book, he's a great writer. We worked on a show together called Parenthood, vegetarian activist, vegan activist, and he's just great. I was a vegetarian for a while, then I became a vegan in 1992, and I really like that, and uh, I'm feeling very good, and it's because of diet, and of course, laughter is the best medicine, and Glenn provides that with his wonderful books, and thank you again, Glenn. Yeah, well, that's why I love it. I, that's why I want, I really want to encourage people to buy it early to get the audio because as funny as he is in the written form, when you hear it, it's, I think it's even funnier. Well, he's a great stand-up comic. He started in stand-up, so he, he knows the rhythms, not just on the page, but on the stage. And so uh, go see him live. You're in for a treat. I'm not that. performing live. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are today. We'll you see are. about that. You are right now. That's right. All right. Like this it or not. It. I love that on the page and on the stage. So really 50 years you've been vegetarian and, and, and vegan. That's that's a long time. That's half a century. And I can't imagine what it was like in Hollywood back then because I mean, craft services, how did you eat in 1970? It was so hard back then to be a vegetarian. There was two caterers that ran every set on Hollywood for food. They ran it you know, for food services. There was Raleigh Harper and Ralph Green. And here's what they served every day. And I'm not kidding with this, they served brisket of beef or some other like charred piece of meat. They served canned peas or green beans. Neither were green, they were gray. They served like Barbara Ann's buns and cottage cheese and canned cling peaches. And the workers were falling off the catwalk and from ladders adjusting lights at age 52 because that's all they ate every day. You know, you'd spend long hours on the set eating breakfast, lunch and dinner with that food. And then finally, it began to open up in the 70s. It was Yul Brenner, and he ate good. I think he might have been a vegetarian. He certainly ate good, and he ate a lot of plant food. I know that for a fact. And he opened up. And they, it was a 20th Century Foxer doing a TV version of The King and I with my friend Samantha Egger. And he said, no, we got to have other food, real food on this set. Otherwise, I'm not doing the show. And they finally had cracked the monopoly that these old caterers had on the business and then they opened up and then finally all of them had to offer some real food too. They still have meat and other stuff at craft service, 
and on for the main meals, but they have real food too. Ultimately, it was because of Yul Brenner, I believe. Has it gotten easier when, when you have a job to, to find something to eat? It used to be very hard. Now it's easy. And you'd be shooting in towns like, you know, middle of nowhere, New Mexico, middle of nowhere, you know, many parts of, of the States. And there was nothing remotely vegetarian there that was at all healthy. So it was very hard traveling. Um, but uh, nowadays, when you travel, you, I, I shot in Eastern Europe in the early 90s. And every menu in Prague had vegetarianski on it. You know, that was in the 90s. And it's been that way really since the 90s and ever since. You're hard pressed not to find vegetarian in nearly any part of the world. You know, it's interesting because we know that the vegan diet is unparalleled for human health, animal welfare, and the environment, but it's also unparalleled for weight loss. And with so many women in Hollywood, or just even men too, struggling with weight, you would think that more actors and actresses would, would look into it. My inspirations back in the day were people that were fit. Dennis Weaver was very fit. He was a vegetarian. And, you know, lots of other people that I knew were vegetarians and they're all in very good shape. I didn't know any heavy vegetarians at all. They were all, the health was a big part of their life in every way, being fit, running, you know, exercising in other ways and eating right. So I had my inspirations like Dennis. He was a dear man and a, a wonderful a vegan activist for many, many years. I remember him from the Self-Realization Fellowship where he gave the talk once a month on Sunday. He was, he was extraordinary, I agree. So how did you know at 50 years ago that the environment mattered? Because now it's a big deal, global warming, but I was 10, so you were probably like maybe 20. Like nobody was talking about the environment in 1970. I was 20, AJ, and at that point I'd lived two decades, 20 years in that horrible smog in LA. So I said, enough already. I'm gonna do something to be part of the solution. and that because of me, because of many people, I was only a small part of it. But here it is, 50 some odd years later, we have four times the cars in LA, in LA millions more people, and we only have a fraction of the smog. It all worked. Everything we hoped would work did work. Catalytic converters on vehicles, cleaner power plants, you know, clean fuel buses and other rail and what have you, all the stuff that we did, no spray paint booths with spray paint fumes going up in the LA air shed, all that stuff that we hoped would work did work. And it's a big success that people try to mimic worldwide now. So that's what we need to do. We need to stay the course there. But the smog is what got me involved. Also, my dad was an influence too. He was a conservative and I'm not, but he was a conservative that liked to conserve. We turn off the lights, turn off the, the water, save string and save tin foil. And so he was always saying, Eddie, I know what you're against. You're against the smog, but what are you for? What are you gonna do? So he passed away a few days before the first Earth Day. So I got involved. I started recycling, composting, became a vegetarian, bought an electric car for $950 and started to do everything I could to make a difference with my actions. And the greatest bang for the buck one I did of all of them, the greatest impact on the environment was my change of diet being a vegeta vegetarian. I love what you've done with your life and what you're doing with it. Not that it's over by any means, because I mean, so many people, you know, that are, that have the ability to influence people through being famous or being on television, don't do anything compared to what you've been doing. And I, I know you really practice what you preach. I used to live at 3620 Laurel Canyon, not too far from your house. And I'd see you always were riding your bike everywhere. You really were. I still do. I ride my bike for errands every day. That's great. I'm glad that we were neighbors. Uh, are, we, yep. are you still in the Studio City area? No, I, I left about two years ago. I couldn't stand the, any, the smog and everything in LA. I live in the, in the Coachella Valley near Palm Springs now. Wonderful. It's beautiful out there. Good for you. <laughs> I really have to apologize is. that I got to go kind of, kind of soon, but I want to say again, this book is so funny. It's so informative, so wonderful. Glenn, you're my hero as always. Anything I can do to support you, please let me know. Ed, you're my hero. Yeah, just, just one last question. Tell people how you make toast. Oh, I, uh, I had a bicycle for <laughs> quite a while that was, you know, I'd ride on the street, but I, I sometimes had days that were too rainy or too smoggy to ride it out in the street. So I got this little catalog item and item from the Real Goods catalog. It was a little stand that had a generator on it and you could get a ball tire for your back, you know, a slick tire and put it, this generator touching the wheel and you could ride it and you could charge a 12 volt battery. Well, my system was not 12 volts, it was 120 volts. So I changed that generator with my friend, Howard Latofsky. 
we changed it to a 120 volt generator and it went down into my solar batteries. I had, I had the good fortune of having a solar battery array ready to be plugged into with something like a bicycle. So it was basically a computation. You can not possibly, no human being, great cyclist can ride enough to run a toaster. That's 1700 watts, but you can make about two or 300 watts on a bicycle if you're a good rider and pedal hard, which I am and could. So I'd ride at two or 300 watts for 15 minutes, and that was enough to, for three minutes of 1700 watts. It was a computation, uh, you know, on a calculator, but it was real. The electrons went in from the bicycle and they were pulled out by the toaster. So when my kids want to toast when they're quite young, I said, okay, let's do a little fun game today. Get on the bike and make enough electricity to make toast. And they start riding after about 30 seconds. Am I done? No, not yet, honey. A minute. Are we done? No, not yet. They'd be like panting and wanting to kill me. Are we done? Finally, at three minutes, says, yes, you've had enough energy to make toast. But they really appreciated from that what, how much work it took to make energy to just make toast. It helped them in many other ways in their life. So that's how I make my toast. I love it. And for people that worry that toast is fattening, that is definitely the way to make it. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for endorsing the book. I really appreciate it. But more than that, thank you for all that you're doing for humankind, animal kind, and the planet. Hey, Jay. Thank you for your wonderful food. Keep spreading the word. It's great stuff. Glenn, I'll see Thanks, what more of you I know. Bless you both. I'll see you soon. Thank Thanks you. Thank that. you. Bye-bye. But Bye. don't you guys go away because I still have Glenn here and I'll let you get to know him a little bit. Uh, so who are you, by the way? <laughs> I'm I'm your co-author on three books now. We've got a trilogy. Oh my God, that's great! And maybe what what comes after trilogy? I, a quadrology. I don't I don't know what's next. You know. So he says that you're. What did he say? That was very nice. He said you're as good as good on the stage as you are on the page. Well, he clearly never saw me perform. Yes. You, you're not doing any stand up anymore. Well, you know what? Here in, in Bloomington, Indiana, I uh, went, went on stage a couple times. At, there's a comedy club here. And I did five minutes a couple times just to, just to see if I still had any chops. And did so, you? I was okay. I was okay. So you didn't, you didn't tape it? Because me and Charles have been doing stand-up since the pandemic. We've done, I think, three shows. And I, I think I put a couple of them on YouTube. I love stand I mean, I don't love stand-up. I like the writing of stand-up better than the performing of stand-up. But, you know, you did the Johnny Carson show. Now, when I became a stand-up in 1980 in San Francisco, it was a great scene. Dana Carvey was there, A. Whitney Brown, lots of uh, comedians who went on to fame. Um, but when I was a, at that time, I think young people today don't know it. Going on Johnny Carson was everything. I mean, if you had said to any of us then, if you have to, had a choice between headlining at Caesar's Palace for 50 weekends a year or doing the Johnny Carson show once, anybody would say Johnny Carson show once. You know, it was everybody's goal. And uh, you did it. You, how did that happen? How did you get on Johnny? No, Carson? it was just, I, it's, a, it's kind of, I'm, I, that was my dream since I was seven to meet him and be on the Tonight Show. I had an agent, his name is Sid Levine. If he's watching, I'd love to reconnect with him. I don't know if he's still an agent. And I didn't really do very much. You know, this was in my twenties. I, you know, had very small parts, you know, like what they call it, one liners or under fives, you know, like on shows, like, I don't know trying to think like superior court, something that was on channel nine, you know, just, or where you just like nod your head or say yes, you know, nothing really substantial, but I always had this comedic side and I always did quirky things and, you know, things like that. And so I remember he was, I was in his office just talking to him and he had gotten a call from, I, you know, it's funny that you mentioned this because I was just on the tonight show podcast, which and Gene, I'm answering this right now, how I got in Johnny Carson. I literally told this, I think I told the story on the, on the Tonight Show podcast, which I was so honored to be on because I'm not really like famous, you know, but they, they finally let me on that podcast. So the guy, his name is Bob Dolce. There were more than one booker of the Tonight Show, different, like, like the talent scouts. And he had, and, and apparently there was a client of Sid's, I can't even remember her name, but I got, I should thank her if I could ever meet her, who somehow got an audition with Bob Dolce to be on the Tonight Show. She was an actress 
you know, beautiful blonde actress. And I was sitting there in his office when he called and Bob said, look, I'm sorry, we're, we, we can't have your client on the show. And he didn't even know because he didn't submit her. And he said, do you have any, you know, the, you know, enough with the Hollywood actresses, the beautiful blondes, do you have any like real people? And Sid goes, yeah, as a matter of fact, I got one sitting in front of me. So I, I got the audition and, you know, like they, as they say, the rest was history. Cause once, once, you know, they, they often say it's not what you know, but who you know, but you, you know, I think who you know gets the foot in the door. Who you know doesn't always get you the job though. Do you know what I'm saying? Right. Yeah, well, you have to be prepared for the lucky break. You have to Absolutely. be ready when yes. you, you were. Know, in China, they say that there's no such word as luck. It's preparation meets opportunity. And so, it, you know, so, so there is some luck in getting the opportunity, but yeah, it was, I was very, very nervous. I, I mean, I almost didn't get on after I got on because I was, I was, my anxiety was like making them all nervous because it, you know, it's, it was a big deal. And it's still like, you know, when I think about getting married and, uh, and that, and then also, you know, being, uh, speaking at the McDougal Advanced Study Weekend, like if people say like, what are the three greatest things? Those would be the, the three. The, and they were also the things that made me the most nervous. So, <laughs> yeah. But I was, uh, on, I was on Letterman too. And I was on with yeah. Joy Bishop in The Tonight Show. I was on Jay Leno at The Tonight Show. So yeah, it, it's good. But um, it's a lot easier doing things on Zoom because if I get nervous, I can always, there's a little button that says end meeting, you know? <laughs> So in between those Tonight Show appearances and late night appearances, did, were you headlining on the nightclub? Circuit? No, I wasn't. Because, you know, one of the things is it's almost like being on the Tonight Show so early in one's career. It's almost like you peak early. Where do you go? Down. Yeah. So I, I, it, it's and also my anxiety got the best of me. It just it was very it was almost like I wasn't ready for that at that time. I was 27. It was September 1st, 1987. But it was still, he was, he is so nice, Johnny Carson. He's like we say, such a mensch. He's just a good person. And I, it was just, it was just so wonderful meeting him. He'd always come to my dressing room. He was just very kind, you know, and, and very encouraging. Yeah. Yeah. So well, I can't say enough good things. So, oh, here's a question for Glenn. Okay, let's see. So Hope says, what is the best, funniest part about working with Chef AJ on the new book? <laughs> the best, funniest part is, I guess, um, trying to find a way to get you to stop perfecting your recipes. Yeah. Because... Um, You'll give, a, you'll give me the recipe and then a week later you'll say, no, let's add a little of this and no, let's take away a little of that and no, let's, add, and I'll be saying it's, it's delicious. I know I drive, I, I would drive anybody crazy with that because I, I you know, because a lot of times, you know, part of the reason is, is I don't cook with recipes, even my own. And then I'll say, well, I don't have this. I'll put this in. And I'm like, this was better, but I understand from your perspective, we can't keep doing that. And, and, and one of my best recipes, which will be this week's weight loss Wednesday, didn't make it in the book. Cause you, at some point you made it stop, you know? You it stop. <laughs> so what, when did you discover that you had a talent for recipes? Oh gosh, you know, probably when I was seven, I'm not kidding. Like I had this easy bake oven and it was so fun. I just like making stuff up. My, my parents were much older when they had me, they were like, you know, almost, my, my dad was 50. My mom was almost 50 and I hit my brothers and sisters were like 10 years older. And so like, there was nobody to play with me, you know, except the dog, it was Snoopy. And cause they were either in college or out of the house. And so my mom was one of the first working mothers, you know? Uh, so I, they, my mom just to entertain me, she'd like, give me something like she'd give me a shoe box and a scissor. She goes, make something or give me a strawberry box. And so I got very used to like just being creative with stuff and food is just a way to be creative. You know, I look at it just, you may, I love making stuff up. It's just, I love arts and crafts to this day. So I think that's really how I got into it. Plus, you know, if you remember from Unprocessed, I lived with the, my aunt whose mother was that French chef. And all I did was see her make everything from scratch every single meal, no recipes, all from fresh, you know, food. So, you know, you kind of, you know, you see it and it's like, well, that looks like fun. So to me, it's like, it's not even about how good the recipe is. It's just, it's the fun of making it. Just like when I paint all around me in my office or things I painted, a lot of people would probably think they're terrible, but I had so much fun making them. Well, I like how you painted Chef AJ behind you. Uh -huh. Well, that was that was Janine Elder, who, by the way, did the, the, the beautiful job on the book. She's amazing. I wish I had known her for our first two books, you know? Yeah. 
And speaking of books, I don't know if you guys know that uh, Glenn wor was worked with Howard Lyman, who's a big hero of mine. We almost had him on today's show. We didn't know how long Ed would be able to stay. But Mad Cowboy and No More Bull. How did you hook up with Howard? Howard is awesome. Yes. Well, um, I, um, I tell that story actually um, uh, in a YouTube video that's uh, on the website, uh, which is ownyourhealthbook.com. Um, that uh, Mar, you, you know Mar, Mar mm -hmm. Nealon, had uh, introduced me to Howard and they pitched the idea that, uh, of writing a screenplay about Howard's life. And um, Howard's life story, for those who don't know, it's a, you know, it has a great arc to it. He was a fourth generation cattle rancher in Montana and he turned into a vegan and animal rights activist. And then it was Howard who was on the Oprah Winfrey show talking about the dangers of mad cow disease that got he and Oprah Winfrey sued uh, by some cattle ranchers in Texas uh, because Oprah said she wouldn't eat another hamburger and there were some cattle ranchers who seemed to feel she didn't have the right to say that. Uh, at, at that time, we were feeding cows to cows. We were chopping up cows and feeding them back to cows, which is what led to mad cow disease. So uh, Mar pitched the idea of writing a screenplay based on Howard's life. But from what I can tell, Howard's life story, though fascinating, just ended with, or at that time, came to the point where he was a vegan an animal rights activist, and I couldn't see an ending to it. You need a good ending for a screenplay. And I didn't see a screenplay ending with him ordering the stir fried vegetables at a restaurant. So I couldn't think of a way to write it. Um, and so I, I said, I, I just don't see it as a screenplay. And then Moore said, well, then how about a book? And I said, well, I could try a book because uh, in a book, you don't need that third act climax. And together we wrote Mad Cowboy. And then we did a sequel. In Mad Cowboy, we predicted that mad cow disease would come to America. And it did, not as terribly as it came to Great Britain, but there were isolated cases of it. So then we wrote what I call our I Told You So book, which was called No More Bull. Did Mad, Cow mad Cowboy did pretty well, didn't it? Yeah, I think it sold about 100,000 copies. Have we sold that many? <laughs> I, don't look, I don't like to look at the numbers like you because I'm so, I'm so uh, superstitious and I'm afraid if I check, then I, you know, I don't want to see things go down. But uh, you think we'll be able to one day outsell your book with Howard? Well, uh, Own Your Health is selling pretty well in this first week. So yeah. well, we want to thank everybody. For, for example, Karen said years. the new book is great. Thanks to both of you. And you. Renee Karen. says, I received the book. Look forward to reading it. I really want to remind you guys, if you buy the book before the 18th at midnight, 18th of October, email that Amazon receipt to Chef AJ Bonus at yahoo.com. Because if you like reading it, I'm telling you, it's even better when you listen. It just is. The, the voice actor did a great job. And, and some of the, sometimes when I read things, I don't know their jokes, but when the actor reads them, oh, like, okay, that was funny. You know what I mean? So Glenn, we have a question from Barbara for Glenn. When, when and why did you become vegan and how did you and AJ meet? Okay, um, a lot of that story is in the book, um, but, but not how AJ and I met. I became a vegetarian at first at 17 because uh, all my relatives were dying off. M most of the men in my family died in their 50s of heart disease. My, my two uncles, my mother's two brothers died of heart attacks, one in his 50s, one in his late 40s. My mother in her then early 50s had angina and would, would um, get chest pain when she walked up six, ste six steps into the kitchen. So I figure if I eat the way these people eat, I'm middle-aged at 25. And I was 17. I didn't want to be middle-aged at 25. So I became a vegetarian inspired by the late great comedian Dick Gregory. Um, and um, I got up in the morning. I decided I would start on the first day of summer vacation after my junior year in high school. So... First day of summer vacation, got up in the morning, had an English muffin with jam for breakfast. My, the phone rang, it was my old buddy, Dave. 
I said, Dave, congratulate me. I became a vegetarian. He said, oh, congratulations, since when? And I said, well, you know, since breakfast. And he laughed at me. And once he laughed at me, I knew I'm never switching. I, you know, I'm not gonna let him get the last word on this. So uh, I haven't had any dead animals since, uh, how many years ago is that? 47 years. And, um, and I never regretted that, but I did regret, I did learn to regret the fact that I, at that point I only became a vegetarian. I didn't become vegan for another 19 years. And I had started to develop some kind of strange chest pain. It was like an electric shock. I don't know what it was. I've, I've never consulted with a cardiologist about it. I don't know. But for a period of a couple months, when I was in my mid thirties, I guess, I would suddenly get this electric shock in my chest area. And it was so bad that, you know, you almost couldn't disguise it. It would almost knock me to the ground. And I decided, well, either I can go to a cardiologist or I can stop eating dairy. So I thought I'll try first to stop eating dairy. And I stopped eating cheese and all other forms. The cheese was really the only form of dairy I had been eating. So I gave up the cheese and it never happened again. So what it was, I don't know. Was it legitimately heart disease? I don't know, but it never happened again. And that was, uh, 27, 28 years ago that I gave up cheese. So uh, that is part of the idea for Own Your Health. The idea that, you know, there are times when it helps to consult doctors and there are times when you might just figure it out yourself with diet and, uh, and, and using diet as the first your first resource in improving your own health. Um, and uh, that's what I've always done. And I tell the story in Own Your Health of my wife, Joanna, who uh, was struggling with what was diagnosed as lupus. And it was terrible, it was terribly painful for her. And she was already a vegan. So she would say to me, it looks like the vegan diet isn't working for me. Well, the problem was it was the type of vegan diet we were on. She, she needed to be off gluten. I don't know if she has celiac disease or not, but we know that she improved when she got off gluten. And she also needed to learn to have a lot of probiotics and some fermented foods and um, uh, those, and, and to, she needed to have cooked foods. Now I know Dr. Brooke Goldner overcame lupus and she had a lot of kale smoothies. Uh, that didn't work for Joanna, but whatever works for you, often the solution is through nutrition. You know, it's interesting how so many people like you and Ed and, and many other people to become, and Linda Middlesworth who's watching said the same thing, they become vegetarian first. and as much as I don't want people to eat any animal products, it, we know that dairy is actually the most deleterious. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And you know, in those days, it was considered extreme to become a vegetarian. You know, everybody was asking me where I get my protein. And that's why I kept the cheese in my diet because I stupidly assumed that I needed cheese to have protein. Uh, when it turns out, of course, that there's protein in, in virtually everything. There's tremendous amounts of protein in legumes, there's protein in mushrooms and vegetables. Uh, there's protein in grains. You just don't need to worry about protein if you're eating whole foods. You, just you don't, don't have to worry about anything. You don't have to worry about calcium. You don't have to worry about omega-3. If you eat it, you know, it's just, yeah. Dr. Lyle talks about this, looking for health in all the wrong places. All the problems are caused by excesses, not deficiencies. So yeah. you have worked with a lot of vegans, you know, writing books. It's not just Howard Lyman. You wrote one with Pam Popper. You wrote one with Del Strofe. You wrote uh, Three With Me. Am I missing anybody? Benji Kurtz. Benji Kurtz. Um, and then I edited a book with Eric Brent, The Happy Cow Cookbook. Nice. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's all my co-authors, I think. I hope I'm not forgetting anyone. And it's funny because a lot of your books have to do with people that are 
wanting to lose weight. And, and it's interesting to me because that is something that has never been a problem for you. Correct. However, um, you know, I evolved from vegetarian to vegan and then from vegan to a healthy vegan, because initially when I was a vegan, I was eating, you know, a lot of those uh, fake hot dogs and, and, um, um, you know, vegan chicken nuggets or things, different vegan foods that were made to resemble unhealthy animal-based foods. Um, and I was having oil, um, cooking sometimes with olive oil. When I gave up oil, and, and at this point, we, Joanna and I never cook with oil. We occasionally eat a restaurant meal and even less often now in the pandemic. But um, uh, so sometimes uh, in, in a restaurant, uh, I might reluctantly have some oil. But basically when I gave up oil, I went from being 160 pounds to about 150 pounds. And uh, when I was 160 pounds, everybody said, oh, Glenn's skinny. Well, I, maybe I was skinny by American standards, but clearly there was 10 pounds of unnecessary fat on my body that came off when I gave up oil. That's funny because yes. I did the same thing to Charles when we heard Dr. When I heard Dr. Russellson speak in 2008, I just stopped using oil. I didn't tell him he was already thin. He didn't know because you can't taste the difference without oil. And he, yeah, he lost like like nine pounds. <laughs> it's like he thought he was dying. He's like, oh, my belt doesn't fit. So it's just so interesting how it's uh, there seems to be such a divide between people. And, and, and it's not like you're just vegan for health or just, this is what I love about Ed Begley is he's vegan for all the reasons. He, you know what I mean? Yeah. He, he, didn't, he doesn't just say, well, no, the environment's more important than the animals or the health, but it just seems that people sometimes come to it from one point of entry, but, but the ones that, that are in it for animals only that don't care about their health, they often bash people like you and me that eat a certain way or write books because they say, well, we make it harder for people to be vegan because, you know, no oil. And I, I don't agree with that. Well, you, when you think about all the problems that are in the world, so many of them are caused by this foolishness of eating dead animals and, and raising animals for food. You know, we have global warming, which is maybe the most serious problem facing humanity. And one of the leading causes, perhaps the single leading cause of global warming is animal agriculture. We have, um, we have water pollution, the leading cause of which is animal agriculture. We're suffering a pandemic now. It wasn't caused by anyone eating zucchini. It wasn't caused by anyone having steamed vegetables and rice. It was caused by and, you know, animal food. Uh, they think a wet market in China. But in any case, there was, you know, there's swine flu, bird flu. I'm reading Michael Greger's book now about pandemics and, and the greatest risk to us may be from, from uh, uh, a, a, a chicken related bird flu. You know, we may suffer one pandemic after another because of animal foods. You know, it, the pandemics are caused by crowded populations of animals being close to any human beings. Crowded populations of animals breed disease. And, you know, some people will say, well, I, I'm against those CAFOs, those confined animal feeding operations, but I, I eat free range chicken or free range beef or something. But you know, they're, they're, you can't feed 7 billion people in the world uh, if, you, if they're going to eat animals, th there wouldn't be enough free ranges in the world to feed them. So the, 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 um, the way we, we stop this problem is just not to eat animals at all, you know? And uh, there's no need for it. Where health, another problem that we have is, of course, the obesity in America, which is largely caused by the animal-based diet. We have 
the problem of, of heart disease and cancer and so forth, all related to the animal-based diet. So all, all the money we waste on, on medical care, you know, and you, you hear politicians talk about, whenever they talk about health, all they talk about is health insurance. There's not one candidate who ever runs for president saying, let's make America healthier. They only say, here's my plan for health insurance. Who cares about the health insurance? How about focusing on the health? And the only way to improve the health is to get the damned animal products out of the diet. Well, and, and we got, you know, and processed food too, Glenn, because I mean, as yes. much as I don't want people to eat animal products after interviewing 40 doctors from my GI Health Summit, these processed foods and ultra processed foods are not health promoting in and of themselves. That, that's and true that's, too. It's, it's the sugar as well. It's the soda as well and so forth. It isn't only animal foods, but animal foods are at least half the problem with, with health. And they're a big part of the problem with the environment. And they're the sole cause of pandemics. Absolutely. That is so true. So Stephanie, who's watching live, says, in chapter nine, you talk about public policy. Do you feel someone's science based like Dr. Neil Barnard could ever be chosen to the Surgeon General or would that never happen because of politics? Well, in fiction, it can happen because Glenn actually wrote a novel called Off the Reservation where there was a vegan president. Yeah, well, I remember when Obama was trying to get uh, Obamacare passed and he had he was struggling to get the, you know, the last votes in the House for Obamacare. It was a very, very close vote. And I tried to contact Congressman Dennis Kucinich, whose vote was, it was not certain which way he was going to vote on Obamacare, I think because everyone knew that he favored the Bernie Sanders sort of plan, Medicare for all and the public option, which wasn't part of Obamacare. And I tried to contact him and say, Dennis, vote for it on the condition that Neil Barnard becomes Surgeon General of the United States. Uh, I don't know if he ever got my communication on that. He certainly didn't take me up on that. But I think that that's what we need to do. I think we need to fight to make Neil Barnard Surgeon General of the United States. I think when the next time when, when uh, candidates are on the trail and they're speaking in town halls, we need to say, Will you appoint Neil Barnard, Surgeon General of the United States? Let's make it a cause. It would be a wonderful thing for the country if he were Surgeon General. I agree. I, would, I love him so much, or even I, I'd take him as president. So Christina says, did you have any friends that were vegetarian when you were younger? I can say that I'm 60 and I didn't have my first vegetarian or vegan friend till I was 40, so I didn't. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't remember anyone else in high school who I knew who was vegetarian. And I don't remember in, co in college, I might've, I, I, I there, you know there were a couple of, uh, couple of girls in college who were vegetarian who I knew, but very few, it was very rare in those days. And vegan, I hardly ever heard the word. I don't remember when I first heard the word vegan. Do you, AJ? No, uh, probably, at least, not, I don't think until my thirties, I, I didn't yeah. have a word for it, yeah. yeah. I, so, I didn't even consider it when I became a vegetarian. It, I didn't really think about it. Should I go vegan? I wouldn't have known the word to call it. And, and yet it had been coined quite a long time ago by, was it Watson? Donald Watson? Was that his name? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. November 1st, I think is World Vegan Day coming up. So Glenn, I have to go back to the question because people that aren't food addicts or overweight fascinate me because there's so few of them that I actually meet. And I, you know, we, people ask how, uh, we didn't answer the question on how we met. So maybe we'll answer that one oh. first and then I'll ask you my question about working with people that were obese and the perspective of the writing. But tell us, tell us how you met. I mean, how, how we met. <laughs> tell me how you what? met. I'm not 100% sure, but I think, AJ, that we met at a veg source convention in Woodland Hills. And I noticed there was, the, and you then were, how, how much weight did you lose between then and now? Between then and now, 50, but from my all time high, more like 80. Yeah. Okay, so you were about 50 pounds heavier. And I thought, who is this? somewhat overweight woman who everybody seems to know except me, <laughs> you know? You, I thought, how does everyone know this woman? Who is she? 
you were well known in LA and you were well known in the vegan community, but I hadn't met you yet. So I think I met you at that convention. And um, I remember people would ask questions after people like uh, Dr. Greger or Dr. McDougall spoke, the audience would ask questions and you would ask more questions than anyone else. And I thought, who is this woman? Well, what, what's she doing in the, you know, what's her part in this movement? And then I learned you were a chef. Um, and then a couple years later, you talked to me about unprocessed. I wonder how that, I remember the lunch at Hugo's because we were under yeah. a time crunch because I was speaking at the McDougal yeah. Advanced Study Weekend, February of 2011. But I don't even remember, how, I think it was at a game party at Michelle's. I don't even know, but thank God we met, huh? Yeah. I, we changed each other's lives for the better yes. for sure. Absolutely. So I want to ask you this question because people like you and Charles and Doug Lyle fascinate me. People that have never had a weight problem because the, the 10 pounds you lost wasn't because of food addiction. It was because of calorie density. You stopped eating right. oil. You didn't, you didn't have to do anything to do that. So you've worked with three people that are, well, at least two of us profess to be food addicts, but three of us were at one time obese. And when you hear these stories, like what goes through your head? Like, I don't really get it, just eat. Like what, I mean, what's it like to, to like, cause if I don't, it's like for me trying to put my, I have empathy for people that are alcoholics. I have friends and family members that are, I don't, I'm not trying to mock this or tease them, but I don't understand what it's like to be an alcoholic. Cause I, I just never drank alcohol, right? So for somebody that's never struggled with food that has written basically now, you know, three to four books with people that, that do what, what, like, what is your takeaway? What, how do you, what do you make of the situation? Well, I, I understand that it's tough. I understand that some people have a hard time losing weight. And, and I think you and I have both known people who say they eat right, but still the, the pounds don't come off. Uh, now, you know, the overwhelming majority of people who follow your prescriptions will lose weight, will we'll get to their ideal weight. But the question I have, and I don't have an answer for it, I'd be interested what you think. Are there some people, 1%, I don't know, who still eat right, eat the way you eat, eat the way I eat, and they still have a weight problem? Are there some people who have some genetic problem or some reason why it's tougher for them? I'm sure they do, and it's multifactorial, and you know, in our in our membership group, Feel Fabulous Over 40, this is something that Dr. Lyle talks about, but my understanding is, is it's pretty hard to sustain obesity if you eat the way we recommend in our books. You can have some additional weight, if, especially if they're eating to the right of the red line. Absolutely, you can, you can eat you can eat a perfectly healthy diet and still be overweight if you're including, you know, the calorically dense foods, the nut butters, the tahini, you know, bread, right. you know, Ezekiel bread. So yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to me because from your perspective, you see that a lot of people do suffer, even though you've never. Yeah. yeah, I understand that. And I know it's tough, but I also know that eating right, as you say, it, it may be someone doesn't achieve their ideal weight if they're eating some foods to the right of the red line, but they'll certainly get healthier if they're basically on a low fat plant-based diet. Uh, compared to the standard American diet. Well, that, that is true. That It's never not worked, right? <laughs> right. I mean, that always works. You, you know what I wanted to ask you? So Ed said that you guys met on Parenthood. So were you working yeah. on, on a television show? You never yes, I, I, I was writing Parenthood. I think there have been a couple of TV shows called Parenthood. This was the one that was in around 1989 or 1990. And it was off the success of the movie Parenthood with Steve Martin. Um, and it starred Ed, Ed, and there was a 12-year-old kid on it named Leonardo DiCaprio. And had I known, I would have spent a lot of time hanging out with that kid, but I, I didn't know. So uh, I, uh, I was just with the writing staff. On the writing staff was Joss Whedon, who went on to create Buffy the Vampire Slayer and uh, direct Avengers, and of course is one of the most sought after writers and directors in Hollywood. So uh, there were a lot of great people involved. 
Uh, but uh, my favorite and the one who's remained a friend is Ed. So, but, but he, he's the actor, you're the writer. How did you guys become friends? Did you know each other or vegetarian or vegan at the time? Um, I don't remember too well. I think that we didn't spend a lot of time together on Parenthood. I'm sure we didn't, but we met. And therefore, when we uh, re-met a few years later, uh, I was with Joanna and we were in a uh, vegan restaurant in LA and ran into Ed. You know, I said hi and we, he invited us to join him at the table and, and we started up our friendship again. So I think if I hadn't met him, you know, writing on the show, then I just, you know, I wouldn't have re-met him and run into him and known and been able to reacquaint with him. That's so cool. Well, I remember when I lived in LA, you'd often do uh, the play readings at like the Directors Guild and you had some pretty big stars there. You had, I remember there was Jason Alexander, I think Francis, Francis Fisher. Yes. Uh, who, how did you get all those people to read your play and perform it? Uh, well, uh, and that was at the Writers Guild, not the Directors Guild. Um, uh, Jason is a friend. Uh, Francis was a, is a friend of a friend. I don't really know her well. Um, and, um, you know, I got, uh, uh, I think Kevin Pollock was in one of the, uh, my readings. And Kevin and I had known when we were stand-ups in San Francisco. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I found people for those readings and those readings were fun, but I could never get producers into the audience. Yeah. So it was more just for me to hear my screenplays. Were any of those people vegan or just Ed? As far as I know, just Ed. Aww. That's, so what do you but want? But Jason, I, I spoke with Jason recently and he told me that he's, He's getting closer and closer to a vegetarian diet. Yeah. Wow. Well, can we send them all your book? <laughs> Our book? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Wow. That's, yeah, it's just, I, you know, I wish I had a little bit more time with that because I'd really like to know, like, what, what he, what, what do all the other people in Hollywood think of people that are extreme like this, you know? Yeah. And, and what we all have to realize is the extreme thing is actually, you know, putting, 30,000 chickens in a, in a warehouse. And, you know, the things they do in animal agriculture are extraordinarily extreme. What we do is we eat human food. It's actually normal. So, uh, okay. Oh, so, AJ, I need to wrap up. Yeah, okay, well, last question. What, it's, fun, it's funny how everybody like lately has to, with Zoom, they got another one to go to. What do you want to be known for? What do you want Own Your Health to be known for? I want Own Your Health to be known for as the book that really started to end the debate about animal-based foods versus plant-based foods. The debate is over, we won. There's no health benefit to animal-based foods. All the health benefits are to plant-based foods. The argument is over, it's settled science. Now we have to realize our struggle is against the culture. It's not science versus science, it's science versus culture. We have to change the culture. Do you have time to answer Gina's question, how you ended up in the Midwest? Um, we're climate refugees. California has been burning. And so we wanted a humid climate and I wanted a college town. So Bloomington, Indiana was perfect. Wow. Cool. All right. Well, thanks so much, Glenn. Good luck with the book. Even if I wasn't involved, still good luck and mazel tov on how well it's doing. Thanks all of you guys for watching the show and for supporting our book. Remember, it's not too late to get all those bonuses if you send us your Amazon receipt by the 18th. Thanks for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please do come back tomorrow when we have at least two shows. Yep, we, we do. We have at the regular time, 11 a.m., Ginger Burr, who is a vegan fashion consultant, and she's going to do a color analysis on me. I cannot wait. And at 1 p.m., our monthly feature of Tuesday with Thomas for a cooking demo. Thanks again, Glenn. Take care. Thank you, AJ.